This is no place for a horse. The Darksiders franchise was weird, in the best kind of way possible. These games had some of the most interesting stories, character designs, and surprisingly, deep lore. Yet I still feel that they're massively underrated. Now, when I say that, I don't think they're the second coming of Jesus Christ or anything like that, but I also feel that they never got the chance to be as loved as much as they could have been. Upon release, they all received good reviews, and over the years, have maintained a dedicated fanbase, which managed to keep them alive, resulting in a slight revival of the series, even through an entire studio closure. Bruh. They even managed to get a spin-off game, as well as a few books and comics alongside the games to help build out the overall lore of the universe. Because even though a lot of characters are adapted from the Bible, there are a lot of unique stories to be told within these games specific universe. Like for example, the fact that God is no longer alive in this universe, and that's because I killed him three weeks ago in a Macca's car park. Anyway. Each entry into the series attempts to improve upon concepts in the previous game, whilst also adding new mechanics to evolve, by not sticking to being just one strict genre, as they blend influences from other games into their core gameplay. They all fall under the classification of an action-adventure game, but still have a unique individual identity from one another. Darksiders 1 is most like a combination of a Zelda and God of War game. Darksiders 2 is still heavily inspired by Zelda, but takes on more influence from the Metroidvania genre as well as blending in a few RPG elements. And Darkseiders 3... Which gives each individual entry into the series a distinct identity, so that each game ultimately feels unique from one another, and yet still familiar. Each game's story focuses primarily on the namesake of each writer. War's story is related to his internal conflict around the literal war he is accused of starting. Death is consistently caught in the conflicts of dying worlds and dealing with the emotional weight of his past act of killing his own race, and Fury's story focuses on her confronting her own worldview to prove herself as a capable horseman and a worthy protector of humanity. Also, I don't know anything about Strife because I haven't played Genesis yet, so uh, that's why I'm barely gonna mention him. LOL. <laughs> Every entry in the series has combat that all share a lot of similarities, whilst also being different enough from each other to not feel like a lazy reskin. There's a clear focus on hack and slash style combat, as each character has combos that can vary depending upon player input, as well as wrath abilities that complement each rider's unique playstyle. Each horseman's namesake represents key parts of their own personality, goals, and stories. War, who symbolizes destruction, fought for peace, justice, and honor, and cared very little about himself if it meant doing the right thing or to protect others. Death, a being who represents the very concept of his name, actively seeks to prevent it. He kills a Nephilim, yet keeps their souls alive and sought to resurrect humanity, and in doing so, gave up his own life along with the souls of the Nephilim, his own race, to revive humanity, all for the sake of redeeming his brother. And Fury, someone who is consistently aggressive to everything around her, is given the task to hunt down the seven deadly sins, and in the process, discovers that she, in fact, embodied them all, and learned to respect that there is more than just herself in the world, and overcame her own destruction destructive nature for the better of herself and what's left of the human race. Each character's story may seem simple on the surface, but just like the Horsemen, each game shows that they are more than what their names betray them as. All this goes to show that these are more than just run-of-the-mill average action-adventure games. There is so much love, effort, and passion in this series, and that they deserve so much better than what they got. Oh, I'ma keep it Unreal Engine 4 with you, Chief. This is your last warning to go play these games, because from this point on, I'm gonna be spoiling almost everything that happens. That's okay. You can- I'm not going anywhere. The, the, the video will still be here when you get back. Also, you can, uh, skip this section if you want by going here to watch the rest of the video without the timeline section, but I will still be bringing up spoilers periodically, so you might have some key moments spoiled for you regardless. So, uh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the timeline of events that take place over the course of these three games is absolutely fucked in terms of linearity. So here's the recap. <gasps> 
Darksiders 1 prologue. The apocalypse starts, angels and demons start beating the shit out of each other and cranking 90s on all the fucking humans on Earth. War shows up and starts doing a little bit of silly buggers. Oh no, he's posted cringe and got his admin privileges removed. And then fucking dies. <laughs> Then, Darksiders 2 prologue. Death shows up at the Crowfather's place trying to ask how to revive humanity. Crowfather tells him, go to the Tree of Life, and then closes the portal and says, nah, get fucked, dickhead. Death is a little annoyed by this and decides the best course of action is to fucking kill him. Bruh. Then the events of Darksiders 2 and 3 happen at roughly the same time. It's a little confusing. Darksiders 3 happens a little bit earlier than Darksiders 2, but still around the same time, I, I think. Like, I mean, here's Earth in Darksiders 3, and here's how it looks in Darksiders 2, even though they're supposed to happen roughly around the same time. Also, bit fucking weird that Death gets one of Strife's guns, even though Strife still has it in Darksiders 3. Anyway, Fury is tasked by the IRS to capture the seven deadly Twitter users. This plot now never gets followed up on because of fucking course it doesn't. Wow, I wonder why this guy knows so much. Why is he giving me free shit? Oh well, don't look at that gift horse in the mouth, I guess. Fury captures all of the seven deadly Redditors, figures out she was set up by the IRS and sent to Earth to die. Okay, so that's why he knows so much. Uh-oh, the horsemen are being set up. The Watcher was envy the whole time, lol. Fury gets her ass beat and undergoes the most amount of character development in the entire series in the span of two fucking cutscenes. Meanwhile, Death meets some Scottish people, helps create a war crime, ends up in modern day Birmingham, the GOAT, meets Prince Philip, fights borderline copyright infringement, oh hey, Crowfather's back, don't eat any apples here, he really doesn't fucking like it, does a turret section on earth because fuck you, I guess, meets a woman, rebuilds a big stick, gets pissed off by his mother, time travels, fights British Satan, game ends a literal fucking concept, then does a funny little self-reference and fucking dies bringing humanity back to life, and then Darksiders 1 actually starts up again. War begs the council let him return to Earth to prove he was set up. They agree. I sure hope this isn't foreshadowing in any way. War meets British Satan, fights a Scottish man, frees British Satan by killing a bunch of average Australian animals, enters Bunnings Warehouse, reenacts a funny potato game, frees a femboy, gets sucked off by a tree, assaults a woman, rebuilds a bionicle, kills American Satan, and then gives Mark Hamill the best head of his life and has a main character moment. Okay. <sighs> Now you're all caught up, that means I can start talking about- This game came out a year before The Dark Times, and really kicked off the story in a great way, by letting you insta-kill random people before taking away all of your power. Once you're fully in this game, back on Earth a hundred years after everything looks like modern day Britain- Yeah, this is literally the poverty street on TikTok. It really starts to kick things in the gear by having you experience what's become of Earth after its apocalypse. Zombies and corpses litter the area, demonic growths have taken over buildings, and this fucker jumps down to ruin your fucking day. The storytelling in this game works well by showing you first that war is indeed innocent, which gives both the player and the character motivation to clear war's name, and as the mystery unravels, you become more motivated to figure out exactly what happened. Unfortunately though, this isn't the perfect game. At times, there's more padding in this bitch than the baby's car seat. You'll walk through certain areas of the game, and after making your way through, looking for these big ass- What the fuck? You walk through these certain areas of the game, and after making your way through, looking for these big ass rock motherfuckers, you wake them up, and upon doing so, they just tell you to go back through where you just came from, which in all honesty, is really fucking boring. Because you now have to backtrack through the entire area, searching for these boring ass arena time trial things that don't really serve any real purpose. But on the other end of the spectrum, you have these other areas that have amazing level design for you to search through that really utilize your abilities and tools in an engaging way. There really seems to be a trend in this game of throwing shit at the wall and hoping that something sticks, as there's so many different ideas and mechanics implemented in this game, but some aren't given nearly as much time to develop as others, so they disappear almost as fast as they appear. But having said that, the ones that stick around the longest are also the ones that are most fought out. Mainly the story in this game focuses around War trying to clear his name, as both you, the player, and War uncover the mystery of what really happened to cause the apocalypse. And while the storytelling in this game is for the most part pretty straightforward, it still manages to not be boring, as each character introduced is uniquely memorable. And the major twist with the plot is executed so well, and sets up great plot lines for both the sequels to explore regarding it. The major plot twist of the story is that certain angels and demons conspired to cause the apocalypse early, and the council knew of this and did nothing, so that they could use war as a scapegoat and let him take the 
blame. And on top of all of that, one of those angels was corrupted into a demon known as the Destroyer, and even tries to convince War to give up his quest for redemption to instead join him. Only for War to spit some absolute fucking facts. I offer you this choice, horseman. Would you serve in heaven, or rule in hell? I choose what once. A coward did not. Because War is a good character and more than just big angry man with sword. Realistically, the best way I can describe this game is by saying it's like if Zelda and God of War had a child. You can tell this game definitely takes a lot of influence from the Legend of Zelda series, but also has a bit of the God of War series contained within its overall gameplay loop. The God of War influence can be seen mostly in the combat, whilst the Zelda influence comes more from the puzzles, bosses, and level design. The God of War aspects are pretty clear with the combat by way of multiple combos for each weapon, instant kill moves, multiple weapons, and taking on hordes of enemies. While the Zelda influence shows most clearly through obtaining an item to progress a dungeon, and usually that item is also used in tandem to defeat the boss of said area. The combat in this game really does strive to make you feel powerful. While you can still get absolutely slapped around by some enemies, it's satisfying to be able to swing a big sword around and slam five demons into the air, all while being able to follow up with different combos for when they come back down. Overall, the combat is good, but the biggest issue is that it gives you options, until it doesn't. The main idea is that as you use your weapons, they gain experience and become more powerful, which in theory works great. But in practice, just like browsing Twitter, it tends to be a bit shit. There's not much variation in the combos when swapping between weapons, it simply just goes to the next attack string, and the secondary weapons only have combos that last about like 3 hits at most, so you end up only really using the sword for the majority of the game, which is mostly fine but it is frustrating that these other weapons aren't as useful as just spamming the square button over and over and over. You also have four wrath abilities that you can use. Blade Geyser, which, which lets, lets you break, break the fabric, fabric of reality. Be careful on the fabric of reality, Garfield. Immolation, which basically makes you Which is weird, because why can I still see him? Stone Skin makes you get hard. And Affliction lets you summon a few Discord moderators to ban people for posting memes in hashtag general. At everyone. <laughs> what, is, what the fuck did I- did I write this script while I was drunk? To be as fair as possible though, I should mention that sometimes the combat can feel a bit clunky, since sometimes you can just get knocked out of an attack animation by Bruh. something a quarter of your size. But usually you just follow that up by giving them the CIA award for excellence in journalism. And while the bosses are really good, they each have their own set of annoying issues to deal with. Ultimately, with the good reception and sales that this game would receive, a sequel was made only two years later. And thank god it was, because that means I get to talk about- Holy fuck, they put health bars in this game. Finally! Literally everything about this game is an improvement from the first one. Darksiders 2 refines the best aspects of the first game, whilst also introducing new ones into the formula. Combat is improved with more actually useful combos, new secondary weapons that are actually viable, the dodge is genuinely useful this time, and the wrath abilities are more varied and actually worth getting. Traversal has also been updated. Since death is more agile than war, he can run up and along walls, climb pillars, launch himself off things he's climbing, generally climb faster, and the decision was made to shift to a more open world design allowing the player more exploration options. Overall, Death has more diverse movement in both exploration and combat than his brother, War. The story in this game, I think, is personally on par, if not better, than the first game. At first, having your main goal be simply trying to save your brother, it eventually becomes a story about dealing with Death's past and how far he's willing to go to save his brother. Death's biggest regret is that he couldn't fully let go of the Nephilim, even after killing them, and that becomes the main driving force behind the entire story, because the main theme of his character development is how far will you go to save your brother, a question he is faced with multiple times, even at the end of his journey. I stand at last at the Well of Souls, with no idea what I must do next. It is quite simple. And yet, most difficult. And in the end, he lets go of his regret over his actions, realizing that he indeed did the right thing, and that from death, 
can come life. Whilst the game is really good, there are definitely times where it can fall flat. Most notably when the last two areas of the game are noticeably shorter than the first two. But even with that in mind, it's an incredibly solid storyline that spans many worlds alongside a cast of amazing characters. At the start of the game, everything feels much more fleshed out, but as you progress, it really feels like the developers might have been running out of time and or money. I mean, that should be obvious, considering the company closed a year later. Ironic. I mean, after all, in the same game you get this... ...and a couple of hours of gameplay later, you get this. <laughs> but regardless of all that, Darksiders 2 overall is a well-crafted experience from start to finish. Also, side note, the absolute quality of the soundtrack for this game is insane. Like, fucking listen to some of these tracks. Dev is also easily the best playable character in the trilogy, hands down. He's incredibly sassy whilst also being very clear about what he wants in the conversation and tolerates no one's bullshit. You are not welcome here. Pity. I was starting to enjoy the atmosphere. Who did you get here? Took a wrong turn. No one knows you're here. Not a soul. And over the key, it can be our little secret. There is no shame in turning back. No point either. Why are the Hell Guards still on Earth? You lost your ill, in case you haven't noticed. You had no choice but to destroy him, Horseman. Yet if the path to the Tree of Life is to be cleared, I have no choice but to bring him back. How many times would you have me kill him? Just like the exploration aspects of this game, the combat is much more focused on agility. You no longer have a block button, but instead, dodging is much more viable of an option than the first game. As well as the fact that Death has a lot more combat options in terms of how he fights. There's multiple combos that allow you to pause slightly between a hit to activate a different form of the attack. Usually, where Death will stick his sides together to extend his reach, or attack in a wider area, or even launch enemies into the air. Furthermore, for this combat system, there are new secondary weapons that are equally as useful as your main weapons. While they do have the same moves shared between them in each category, they all have a unique charge move for each specific weapon type, so there is at least a little variety in the weapon that you choose. Each player can equip death with different weapons and armor that suit their playstyle best. The loot system in this game is also incredibly divisive, because some people love it, and some people are fucking wrong. But I think it provides an opportunity for player freedom, as everyone will end up having their own death. In the other games, War and Fury have the council's approval and have their specific weapons and powers available to them. So, from a lore perspective, Death has to make use of whatever gear he can find on his journey. So, both gameplay and story-wise, the gear system fits. There's still problems that exist within the combat, but there's less present issues than the first game. The only major problem I notice is that some enemies can knock you out of a combo with attacks that aren't all that powerful which can get frustrating. But, to balance that out, you can stun lock the fuck out of a lot of enemies. So realistically, if anyone has a complaint about it, all I have to say to you is, skill issue. Unfortunately for how good this game was, the publisher would end up filing for bankruptcy a year later. Which was really fucking weird when they randomly announced... Oh. Darksiders 3 is the black shape of the series. To be honest with you, it kind of fucking sucks. And by that, I mean it's fine. It doesn't suck, because there's genuinely enough to enjoy of what's here. But at the same time, there is also an equal amount of things that absolutely piss me the fuck off. I played so much of it that I can tell you it's definitely the weakest entry in the series, but it's not a bad game. It just doesn't live up to the same level of quality as the previous two entries. There's a myriad of reasons to both love and hate this game, as it's clear that Darksiders 3 wanted to emulate Darksiders 1 
one the most, but still carries some influence from Darksiders 2 as well. Unfortunately though, it didn't emulate those aspects of the other games as well as it could have, even though most of what's here is pretty solid. Darksiders 3 is a weird case. It certainly doesn't feel quite the same as the last two games, but to be fair, there's a full six year difference between this game and the last one. And taking that into consideration, as a whole, gaming culture has changed drastically in that frame of time, so of course things are going to feel different. Speaking of how things feel different, let's talk about how Fury's movement works, because I cannot think of a better segue than this one to be completely honest with you. Much like with the combat, each hollow that is acquired throughout the game augments Fury's movement. Each hollow changes how her jump functions. Fire launches her upwards, lightning lets her hover, force turns you into a big magnetic ball, and stasis allows you to wall jump off certain surfaces. Each one of these upgrades to your arsenal improve both your exploration and combat in equal measure. Just like the second game, Darksiders 3 also takes on a Metroidvania influence, as there's a lot of areas that you can't initially reach that intrigue you enough to come back later on to try to reach them with any new abilities that you've collected throughout the game. The story for this game is a lot more personal, as it focuses the most on Fury learning to change herself for the better. And yes, I know saying it's more personal is a weird word to use, considering the last two games focus on the play playable characters' internal struggles, but just, just let me explain. Like I said around the start of this video, Fury's story centers around her hunting down the seven deadly sins, only for her to realize that she represented each of them. And as the game progresses and the more she interacts with each character, she grows little by little to eventually realize she wants to be a better person, which is done so beautifully by showing her have these smaller, more vulnerable conversations about herself. Lust showed me what I could become. It is not what I want to be. And she learns to address her own shortcomings and improve herself. This game also emulates Darksiders 1 for the fact that there is a deeper mystery that Fury has to make sense of throughout the story, which also adds to her overall character development. But even having said that, other points of the story are just so average, which sucks to see because clearly the team working on this had a lot of good ideas, and you can see that there is something good here, but it will always get balanced out with something else that isn't done nearly as well, which is just sad to see. And it's my main issue with this game. You go from these really well animated cutscenes one moment that then just cut to these panning shots where characters move with very little life in them, where they just tell you exposition. And it's unfortunate to see because as I said before, you can tell there is a passion here for this story and this game in general. Like for example, you have this moment where Lust attempts to bargain with Fury by showing her brothers coming to her side and giving Fury what she desires most, leadership of the horsemen. But she's able to realize that this is an illusion as she breaks out of it. And later on in the story, while you're just traveling, this moment is brought up for Fury to redress to show how she's grown since the start of the game. How are you feeling, mistress? There is much to process. I've had to abandon so much in order to move forward. It feels like a loss. And at the same time, I've changed. Changed how? I... I do not know. Which overall is nice, and one of the few times I enjoy seeing this story being told outside of a cutscene. But for every moment like this, there's a moment where a cutscene just awkwardly transitions to a back and forth talking section with no player control, where you're just told almost word for word what's happening. And to be completely fair, the same cutscene thing happens in Darksiders 2. However, the reason behind that is for you to choose your own dialogue options to ask more questions about lore and even pick up side quests, and is completely optional. The difference between it happening in Darksiders 3 and Darksiders 2 is that in 2, it at least felt like it had a purpose, whereas in this game, it's just a sudden transition into a less visually appealing cutscene. Overall, it feels bittersweet because I want to love this game as much as I do the others, but that's hard to do since there's enough to love about this game's story, but also just enough to disappoint you as well. It's something that gets so frustrating because I want to love this game, but every time it pulls me in, it does something to push me away. The world as well is kind of different to the last two games. Not quite open world, but also not quite linear. You're free to explore in a sense, similar to how the world maps of Dark Souls work, but in a much more linear sense. I'll get into more about why that is later. Your main tools for combat and puzzle solving this game are essentially Whip and Nene. I both love and hate the combat in this game because it can either be incredibly tight or you get fucked in the ass 
costs more than a twink at a gangbang. And this is because of something I like to call the Dark Soulsification of games. Now, obviously, you're thinking to yourself at this moment, DJ, what the actual fuck are you talking about? And to that, I say, Good question! I'll explain. After the massive success of the Soulsborne series, a lot of developers took notice of that. And so around this point in time, every second game that came out wanted to be, for better or worse, the new Dark Souls. A few examples being Hollow Knight, Code Vein, Neo, The Surge, and, uh, a few others. And that stayed the same with Darksiders 3, as there's an obvious influence of the Souls series woven into its DNA. The problem is, not every game worked as a Souls-like, and that's pretty clear throughout this game. Whilst it's not the absolute worst thing to be added, it doesn't fit as well compared to previous combat in the series. The changes to the combat in Darksiders 3 have a lot of pros and cons. Some of the good things are that timing your dodges is incentivized with the new arcane counter system, where timing your dodge right before an enemy hits you allows you to perform a counter attack that is further affected by whichever hollow you have equipped, as well as the fact that hollows are also your secondary weapons, that have just as much viability as your main weapon, and augment your movement as well as your combat abilities. Whereas the things added that don't really work are the fact that to heal now, you have to use a dollar store Estus flask, which means you have to be really good at not getting hit, because you have a very limited use of them in between checkpoints. And this is made worse by the fact that the combat system seems designed to work really well for one-on-one -on -one combat, which is really weird considering you have the fuck everybody around me 5000 as your main weapon in this game. But more often than not, you're fighting multiple enemies at once that all tend to beat your ass within an inch of your life in seconds, which just gets extremely fucking frustrating. You can also buy usable items, but once you use one, you have to wait for a long as fuck cooldown before you can use any of the others you have equipped. Every single fucking time that you use an item, and this just gets incredibly frustrating. And to add on to this, enemies respawn every time you die, so have fun clearing out that area again, dickhead. So realistically, the combat can be tighter than a rat's ass or absolute dog shit, and it all depends on the situation. But sadly, more often than not, you're put in situations that just absolutely piss you off. But for all the negatives I've just mentioned, the combat can feel quite enjoyable to play. It's just that you have to go through so many of the bad fights just to get to the good ones. I do not have a smart enough brain to fully express how much I think this series deserves the chance to finish its storyline. Each of these games deserves your time, and more than earns it. If you're interested in any of them, in the slightest after watching this video, I highly encourage you to go play them. For how average they seem on the surface, they're all really good in their own right. Darksiders as a series is so unique, and is one that is well worth spending your time experiencing. God, I hope we get a finale to this series, but at this point, sadly, Sadly, it doesn't look like it's a possibility. But hey, at least we got Darksiders 3 in Genesis after thinking the series was dead, which does at least give me the tiniest amount of hope for the overall future of this franchise. Maybe one day we'll finally get to see Darksiders 4 and be able to see the conclusion to an amazing series. Hopefully. I fought powerless against the demons, and still you accuse me. You must destroy it! I cannot. They could suffer forever, or die tomorrow, and I wouldn't bat an eye either way. Until this is over, you're a dog on a leash. Khan, the greater risk is to do nothing. Hey. This quest we're on is about balance, in the world, and within me, it seems. I can grant your every wish. Can you restore the balance? Get to the tree, now. Your journey is far from over. And what do you want to be? <sighs> I think that's what I'm here to find out. The universe is sick, Horseman. No point either. They believe, as I do, that you possess greater power than even you realize. You knew what would happen here, what I would do. That's why you spared me. No. Then why? Because I would not have the last of Heaven's honor die with its champion. 
All debts are repaid. I stand at last at the Well of Souls, with no idea what I must do next. We command! Oh, shut up! You command nothing but my scorn, and you will know my fury soon enough! I vow to use all of the powers in my possession to protect humanity, and one day, we will set things right, together. You cannot stop me without forever damning your soul! The White City for certain, the Council, and there will be others. You would wage this war alone? No. Not alone. And the number of the Riders shall ever be four.